So, cultural evolution theory. We talked about ethologist, we talked about sociobiology, going to evolutionary psychology. So we talked about genes and genes and genes and genes. What about culture? And this is where cultural evolution theory comes into the picture. Who are key figures here? We have on one hand um, people like Mark Feldman and Luca Cavalli Sforza, uh, who are both uh, geneticists by training. And we also have Robert Boyd and Pete Richardson, who are biologists. But the whole field as such goes back to Edward Tyler. He is the father of modern anthropology. He lived around the same time as Darwin and the two of them um, actually corresponded and had some influence on each other. Tyler was what we would today call a racist in the sense that he believed that humans were, you can distinguish humans in terms of their level of uh, prim primitiveness or, you know, like sophistication. And he, he was a proponent that there is a natural order of human societies and societies slowly move from more s uh, primitive versions of, of human living to more complex versions. And, you know, like living in Victorian England, he gladly believed that uh, Western society, especially the Victorian English society, was the pinnacle of human evolution. So these kind of ideas were around at that time and there was this Lamarckian idea of a progression towards higher complexity. He also um, developed the ideas of what culture is, which I typically has like huge, uh, you know, like all encompassing notions. So everything that humans do is ultimately uh, come back to culture. These ideas kind of disappeared in anthropology. Anthropology moved towards more relativist descriptions of human behavior around the world. So we have Margaret Mead, you might have heard of her. And within biology, actually, it was Dawkins again um, in his famous Selfish Gene book. He started realizing that maybe genes are not everything. And in the final section of, the, of his book, he proposed the idea of a meme. So another type of replicator of important information that is passed on across generations but captures cultural information. So this is, uh, you might have seen all these beautiful memes around, so you can blame um, the biologist Richard Dawkins for that. And this has excited people. So for example Susan Blackmore, she wrote a book, The Meme machine talking about these cultural pieces of information that infest our brains get replicated we pass them on and they also remain relatively stable over time so you know like if you think about these memes that that you see on social media um, we think about them we pass them on and they circulate for some time but the, the problem with the meme idea is it hasn't really caught on in the sense of creating more robust experimental or empirical work. So it, it's a it's a fascinating idea. It has caught on in, in social media, but it hasn't really been creating some substantive amount of empirical work. So in that brings us back to the problem of culture. So Gerd Hofstede, for example, he brought the idea of culture into psychology in the in the beginning of the 1980s. And he argued culture is the collective programming of the mind. So it's all encompassing and it's very difficult to disentangle specific elements within this broad mass, conceptual mass of culture. And the, the same problems were faced by the biologists initially when Darwin proposed his idea, as, as you will remember, Darwin did not know how the process actually would work. So he came up with this idea of pangenesis and you know, like that actually led to a discrediting of the theory that he had been proposing for some time. And it was only after people started identifying the information that is passed on through genes that 
the modern synthesis would kind of resurrect Darwinian thinking. So culture, what could we study there? How can we actually cut culture up to make it, you know, like manageable from a scientific perspective? So even though Hofstadter proposed a way by looking at values, this is not what biologists and, and uh, cultural evolutionists actually focused on. Cultural evolution researchers, um, for example, here's uh, a really important book by Alex Masudi uh, from Britain, focused on information, information often related to technology and also the you know, d development of uh, cultural artifacts. So Masudi famously argued that we can study cultural artifacts, cultural information using a Darwinian lens because there's variation, there's differential reproduction, differential fitness because some bows are better than others and this is being passed on. So there's an inheritance mechanism which is the information being passed on to other individuals. So by focus moving away from this big notion of culture and focusing specifically on information that is relevant for producing cultural artifacts like bows, stone tools, etc., it became possible to look at these transition transmission mechanisms over time. So this idea created a whole group of um, th this created a whole line of research that looked at these transition mechanisms of what kind of information is being passed on, how do we copy information, uh, what kind of information is more likely and more uh, with higher fidelity copied and passed on compared to others. We will talk about this in much more detail once we start looking at human evolution overall. There's also a separate line of research, so sorry, um, what these evolutionary psychologists of course now look at is really this transmission across generation of cultural information. So genes and the environment become relatively less important. So it's the kind of counterpoint to both the sociobiology and the evolutionary psychology movement. So the, the idea is that cultural traits are adaptive, cultural change follows some evolutionary process, so cultural traits emerge, they are devised, then they, they spread according to whether they are useful for solving some problems, are attractive for people to remember, and you know, like whether they fit within existing traits that people have already. And then there's a um, cumulative process of elaboration and refinement. And this is sometimes also related to the idea of cumulative culture or the wretched effect of cumulative culture. The argument here is that these tools, this information becomes more c complex over time. So I don't have to reinvent everything. I can take what my parents have done and I can make small incremental changes that make the, the tool that I'm using more complex and then I pass this on to my children who then of course make the tool more complex again. So we move from a stone axe to a bronze axe to a saw to a chainsaw. And the interesting thing here is through this accumulative nature of culture at some point no single individual will be able to understand all the mechanisms and features of a specific tool. So even though we have space stations, there's no individual on planet Earth that will be able to build and understand a space station and understand all the parts of a space station and be able to build a space station from scrap just by him or herself. So this is the idea of cumulative culture. Through successive generations, the complexity builds up and at some point we are using a larger technological tool without actually understanding how it was produced and how all the different parts fit together. But this is the point that I also want to make. Some of the ideas that were first 
proposed by Tyler in the late 19th century are now also being possible to empirically being investigated again. So these ideas take archaeological, historical, uh, anthropological data and now trying to look at how do societies change over time in specific environments and what can we learn about changes in, in, in societies over time. So in some of these studies, like for example a study here that was um, run by Joseph Watts and you know a couple of New Zealand uh, researchers under the direction of Russell Gray up in Auckland often provides very controversial and potentially novel insights into how societies develop. The important point here that I just want to mention though is that the idea is that even though they can be traced back to Tyler, this kind of um, change of, of, of societies, the important thing of the modern cultural evolution groups are, the, the important difference is that it's not a natural progression, but it is rather an, an attempt to understand how cultural societies evolve under what type of circumstances and also equally how do some tools or some practices disappear and how do some societies have a higher t success to adapt to novel environmental changes compared to others. And so here, here let's look at this, you know, is ritual human sacrifice uh, often coupled to religious systems actually promoted and sustained um, in the context of evolving hierarchical stratified societies. And what they use is they use archaeological data and they now use phylogenies. You have heard the term already so this is how typically in biology species would be related to each other but we can also study phylogenies in relation to human groups. What groups are related to each other through cultural descent and geographical proximity. And then they looked at whether in the record we have some evidence of ritual human sacrifice linked to often religious practice and to what extent was there social stratification. So to what extent were there marked hierarchies in, in those groups or not. And then they can start using uh, phylogenetic, so highly complex mathematical techniques. They can start, you know, like looking at these associations to see which associations go together and what can they tell us about potential historical changes. The interesting thing is by using these very complex mathematical tools they also solve some problems that were first identified by Galton when he tried to identify how human groups change and, and he was not able to solve it and he used uh, some of his insights in a very negative and racist way but these modern approaches allow you to step to some extent beyond these earlier limitations. So what did they do? They group society's evidence from archaeological records in terms of whether the group seemed to be more egalitarian, somewhat hierarchical or highly hierarchical and then whether there's some ritual human sacri sacrifice present or not. And so they compare first of all egalitarian group to any kind of social hierarchy and see whether there is a correlation between the change from a hierarchical to a uh, from an egalitarian to a hierarchical group or not and whether that was associated with the presence or absence of ritual human sacrifice. So the first comparison here, the important point is that egalitarian groups that had human sacrifice practices were more likely to develop into groups that were hierarchical and kept the human sacrifice rituals. There were also all sorts of other relationships but the the change from a hierarchical group with sacrifice back to an egalitarian group with sacrifice was relatively unlikely in the record. 
On the other hand, if we look at already egalitarian and slightly hierarchical groups in relation to very hierarchical groups, what becomes evident here based on the data, those very hierarchical groups that did not have human sacrifices were more likely to over time move back to less hierarchical um, forms of, of social coordination. So the very controversial uh, implication of this data is that human sacrifice f often for the purpose of a higher spiritual religious being was a tool that elites would use to justify and promote and maintain hierarchies within a society. So it challenges the some of these um, notions that we have around religion and that religions often are um, a tool for understanding or peace and rather pr propose that religion, religious beliefs, especially these kind of supernatural punishment beliefs where you sacrifice other humans for to appease a, a greater God, this is a practice that might have been emerged, has been maintained and exploited by the elites in order to create more uh, access and resources for that elite and control a larger group of individuals. So as you can see, these, these tools are very controversial but also very intriguing because they start allowing us have a look into the past and understand what kind of mechanisms might have been associated with changes in human societies over longer periods of time. And so, for example, talking about some of this, this work, there's a database, um, Puloto database of Pacific religions. But an important point, these ideas are also, again, very controversial. So on one hand, we have Russell Gray and we also have um, Joe Bobulia at Victoria now, who use these kind of methods to try and understand a little bit how human societies and specifically religion has evolved over time. On the other hand, we have uh, Rita and her PH former PhD supervisor uh, who are very critical and, and discredit or do not uh, believe that these methods are useful for understanding human evolution overall right so the the important point here that i want to make is you have to engage with these ideas and you have to critically engage with them to understand does it actually make sense to use them and what kind of implications and what kind of generalizations can we draw from this kind of data so the important thing here is use your critical thinking reflect on what you're reading how you engage with this material and whether you would actually think that this is a useful way of moving forward for the understanding of human behavior. But the last thing that I want to talk about is actually, can we bring all these ideas? We talked about genes, we talked about the environment, we talked about culture. Is it actually possible to bring all of this back together? And yes, it is. On one hand, uh, Lumsden and, and Wilson had done already in, in the early 80s with their dual inheritance, the gene culture co-evolution idea. But as, as we talked about, um, that was, you know, that fell flat because Wilson had burned all the goodwill and nobody would understand those complex mathematical models that they were proposing in those areas of, of, of research where they could have made a, pro, uh, a contribution. But then over time, people started understanding using, for example, genetic and, and archaeological research, started understanding a bit more what was going on. So again, some of the cultural um, psychologists that, that started the field of uh, cultural psychology, Feldman and Cavalli Sforza, they were geneticists. So they were aware of both the importance of genes and culture, and they started um, developing some models that could capture the influence of both. And of course, Boyd and Richardson that wrote their famous book, Not by Genes Alone, that talked about how culture is an independent uh, mechanism that we need to take serious if we want to study human um, evolution. And they also 
really early caught on in, in the um, 80s and 90s to the fact that genes and culture potentially work together and in, in a very complex interdependent way. So one example that is always coming up and I think that is worth stating here again and in the section on human evolution we will provide and, and talk about a few more examples is the one on lactose tolerance. A really interesting fact is that as babies we can digest uh, our mother's milk but then over a couple of um, years we lose that ability to digest milk and except for a few places around the world a lot of humans actually as soon as they start drinking milk they have these kind of strong reactions diarrhea and throw up if they uh, if they drink milk as an adult so there is some kind of adaptation specifically in areas in, in northern Europe um, in parts of Africa and in parts of the uh, um, Arabian Peninsula and, and, and parts of Asia where humans can digest milk so there is a genetic adaptation and other parts not so what is going on here and the answer lies in the emergence of agriculture and specifically the um, the emergence of cattle farming so once you have cows you have access to milk and as humans for example you develop this tool and then this this cultural tool of agriculture spread through Europe with time the ability for humans to digest that um, digest the, 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 the fats in, in, in milk also persisted so there was a genetic change that helped humans to digest the milk and it spread with agriculture throughout Europe and the interesting thing here is there are specific genes in our human genome that encode whether we can actually digest lactase or not and the the cool thing is it's an example of convergent adaptation because there's this one gene in our genome and there are four independent mutations that independently occurred multiple times in different parts of the world that increased the tolerance for people to digest milk and there are three major hypotheses for this the one is uh, milk has calcium with which is really really important for uh, taking up vitamin D which is an important vitamin and vitamin D is is really crucial in areas where you don't get a lot of sunlight so the calcium absorption hypothesis uh, proposes that milk was beneficial the ability to digest milk was beneficial in areas where there's not a lot of sunlight essentially northern Europe here the arid environment hypothesis on the other hand suggested milk also is beneficial in areas where it's really dry and there's not a lot of access to clean drinking water so in those environments the ability to digest milk provided humans with one additional source of, of liquids that they would need to survive so essentially in, in parts of very dry parts of Africa and Saudi Arabia and parts of the um, Indian Penin uh, Peninsula and also the pastoralist are, uh, hypothesis that it's essentially in environments where there's a lot of cattle around so a lot of milk then milk becomes an additional source of um, protein primarily that helps humans to survive so those individuals that can digest milk in these different environments would have different um, advantages over other individuals that would not be able to digest milk and the cool thing is that probably all three of them are true so here's a, a project uh, b led by Evert van der Fleert where Evert looked at the environmental challenges so basically um, being located in northern hemispheres so very cold winters 
or summer heat which is associated with the scarcity of, of um, liquid and whether people had access to water through you know like steady rain or not or you know like the availability of, uh, to water through um, uh, access to rainwater and so with the technology that is available which is uh, cattle farming or you know like access or um, the domestication of, of, of cows people had access to milk or not and then depending on the specific environments this would then drive other social and psychological adaptations over time and he made a very sophisticated argument of how these different environmental ecological conditions in interaction with the technology which is cattle farming so a cultural technology would then set pathways that would change the development of societies around the world very complex argument but brings together the idea that there are genetic adaptations in relation to cultural inventions and then in interaction with specific environmental context that sets up trajectories for human groups to develop certain features then which then in turn lead to specific outcomes later on and this is something that in the last couple of years has really gained traction in biology famously there was a there was a discussion in in nature around whether evolutionary theory needs a rethink and one of the key proponents here is Kevin Leyland arguing very strongly yes we need to have we need to rethink what is actually happening in terms of using evolutionary theory and we need to move beyond genes so the evolution of evolutionary thinking is not finished so this idea of an extended evolutionary synthesis which is happening right now so we have um, uh, Eva Jablonski, for example, a geneticist by training, and Kevin Leyland uh, up in, in Scotland, really challenging the idea that genes by itself or culture by itself is sufficient to explain behavior. So they're biologists or geneticists by training, but they take some of these ideas from Lamarck, which um, takes the idea that there are potentially directional changes in evolution and there are acquired traits during the lifetime of, of an individual which are then passed on and this brings all these ideas genes culture environment back together 